We humans tend to just accept the world as we see it. You know, the sky is blue, water's wet. But at some point there was somebody that was the first person to drop something and say, now why does that go down? The first known explanation for gravity was created by Aristotle, who believed that objects just fell to their natural place. He envisioned a series of concentric spheres, with the Earth in the center, followed by water, and then air, and then fire, because fire rises. And of course he believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, so like most things, Aristotle got that totally wrong. Galileo came in later and proved that objects of different mass fall at the same rate, which established a constant acceleration for gravity. But it took Isaac Newton in the late 1600s to describe gravity in mathematical terms that showed that it wasn't just a downward force, but an attractive force between objects of mass, and the more mass, the more force you have. So then Einstein put a tweak on it with his theory of relativity, saying that the force of gravity is actually a curving of space-time around an object with mass. So instead of being pulled down by gravity, you're actually being pushed down by a curvature in space-time. Finally, Peter Higgs put a mechanism to gravity, which brought us closer than ever before to understanding how gravity works in relation to the other fundamental forces of nature. But recently, there's been a possible discovery of a fifth fundamental force, one that would make us have to rethink everything we know about the nature of the universe. Billy Infante asks, can you elaborate on the fundamental forces of nature? They're saying there's a newly discovered one. This question was asked in my 50 question lightning round video, and it was one of a handful of questions that was just too big for that particular video, so it got a video. And truth be told, this is some dense stuff that would require several videos to fully explain it all, so I'm just gonna do kind of a high level overview and put some links in the description so you guys can go down that rabbit hole yourselves. So to talk about the four fundamental forces, we kind of have to step back a bit and talk about the standard model of particle physics. Because it's hard to understand what these forces do if you don't understand what these forces are acting on. Now, this gets pretty complicated, but it's also very basic. When I say basic, I mean this is base level stuff. This is the smallest units of matter and energy in the universe. And it might not make any sense, it might be totally weird, but this is what makes the reality that you experience every day possible. All right, so growing up, we all learned about atoms and how they're structured with the protons and the neutrons and the electrons, and they look like this when actually they look like this. But in our never ending quest to find the fundamental building blocks of nature, we took these atoms and we smashed them together and all this crap came flying out of it. And after studying that crap, we came up with this, the standard model of particle physics. Briefly, the standard model consists of leptons, quarks, and bosons. And the fundamental forces that guide the interactions between these particles are gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear forces. So the protons and neutrons we've all heard about are classified as hadrons, meaning they contain three quarks each. Crack open a proton, you'll find three quarks, two up quarks and one down quark, giving the proton its positive charge. Similarly, a neutron will have two down quarks and one up quark, giving it a very slightly negative, though mostly neutral charge. There are four other types of quarks, top, bottom, charm, and strange, but they decay very quickly and are only part of very high energy interactions. Most of the quarks that exist in protons and neutrons are the up and down quarks. Electrons and neutrinos are types of leptons. These are very low mass particles. The electron negatively charged and the neutrinos lacking a charge. They also come in different flavors as they're known, including tau and muon flavors. So leptons and quarks actually form the building blocks of atoms, so they actually have their own designation, which are called fermions. The gauge bosons are what are called force carriers. They're called that because they carry the fundamental forces. Just as fermions are the smallest possible units of matter, gauge bosons are the smallest possible units of force. The one you're most familiar with is the photon, and that carries the electromagnetic force. This is a little packet of energy that we perceive as light. But when it interacts with an atom, it can cause an electron to jump up into a higher energy shell, and it can also make a proton sort of dance around the nucleus in an energy excited state. That will be important later on. The W and Z gauge bosons carry the weak nuclear force, and this is actually pretty cool. Remember how protons and neutrons are made up of up and down quarks? Well, the weak nuclear force carried by the W and Z boson can actually flip a quark from up to down, which can make a proton into a neutron and an atom with a different number of protons becomes a different element. This is radioactive decay. In fact, this is the process that turns a carbon-14 atom into a nitrogen-14 atom, which is how we do carbon dating. Boom. Now, speaking of those protons, have you ever wondered how two positively charged protons can be sitting right next to each other in the nucleus of an atom? Why aren't they flying apart? Don't positively charged particles repel each other like positive ends of a magnet? Well, they should. So why don't they? That's the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force holds the nucleus and, well, everything in the universe together. 
And there's a reason why it's called the strong force. It's ridiculously strong. In fact, this is why things get all explodey when you split an atom. And the way it works is, well, it's weird. I mentioned earlier that leptons come in different flavors. Well, quarks can come in different colors. They aren't really colors, of course, but this is the best way to describe how they work. In each hadron, again, that's a proton and a neutron, they have three quarks, and those quarks come in three different quantum states, red, blue, and green. Now, much like in order to get white light, you have to shine red, blue, and green light together to get that white light, in order for a hadron to be stable, it has to have a red, blue, and a green quark. This is a principle called quantum chromodynamics. Now, if everything was a normal physical thing in the quantum world, everything would be hunky-dory, right? You'd have a proton with a red, blue, and a green, we're all good. That'd be it. But of course, the quantum world doesn't work like that. These quarks exist in probability stage, which means that they change their colors all the bloody time. Luckily, there's this ridiculously strong nuclear force at work, and it's being carried by a ridiculously strong gluon. Get it? Because it glues everything together? Ha! <laughs> Physicists. The gluon is kind of like a hot potato that gets bounced from one quark to another, constantly changing their colors to maintain this stable chromodynamic state. So that's how it holds the hadrons together, but it actually is so strong that it bleeds outside the hadron and gets picked up by something called a pion, which is made up of a pair of a quark and an antiquark. Now those decay almost immediately in nanoseconds, right? But that in that time, it takes the gluon from one hadron to another and binds them together. That's what holds the nucleus together. I guess that makes sense? Now the last force I'm gonna talk about is the one that I started this video with. It's the first force we were ever aware of, and it is still the most mysterious one out there, and that's gravity. Now according to the standard model of particle physics, gravity should have its own force carrier particle, which would be called a graviton. But here's the thing about gravitons. They're still just theoretical. They've never been found. Now what has been found, and is so far the closest we've come to really understanding how gravity works, is the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is a fundamental particle of the Higgs field, which interacts with other particles to give them mass. One of the best explanations I've heard to describe how the Higgs field works is to imagine a crowded nightclub. The people in the nightclub represent the Higgs field. So if Jay-Z were to walk in the door, all those people would crowd around him. They would interact with him very heavily, and it would take him a really long time to get through the crowd and get to the bar. But if you or I or any other yokel walked in, then nobody would really pay that much attention to us, so we could walk straight through the crowd with very little interaction and go straight up and get a drink. It's the interaction with the crowd that makes Jay-Z have a lot of mass and it's the lack of interaction that makes you or I fairly massless. That, by the way, is why photons travel at the speed of light, because they're massless, so they don't react in any way to the Higgs field. The Higgs boson was officially discovered at the Large Hadron Collider in 2013, but it was first proposed by Peter Higgs back in the 1960s. By the way, that discovery won Peter Higgs the Nobel Prize for Physics, and he's still out there doing his thing at 87 years old. Good show, old chap. So the way they discovered this was there were two different teams at CERN that were working independently and totally blind to each other. And they were colliding particles over and over again thousands of times looking for a statistical bump in this particular energy level where the Higgs had been predicted. And both of these teams found anomalies in between 125 and 126 giga electron volts, which is exactly where the Higgs had been predicted. Their research showed a statistical significance of five sigma, which means the probability of this happening purely by chance was one in three million. Okay, so that's where we are right now. If your brain is still in your head, <laughs> I'm gonna keep going and explain why a team of researchers believes they may have found a new particle and why if they did, it might be one of the biggest discoveries we've made so far. So a team of researchers in Hungary were studying beryllium-8 atoms when they found a surge of energy that was happening at an alarmingly consistent rate. Okay, so remember I said earlier that protons can be hit with energy and go into an excited state? Well, when that happens, it eventually has to settle down, and in order to do that, it has to expel that energy in some way. So sometimes it can pop out as a photon, sometimes it comes out as a particle-antiparticle pair. In beryllium-8 atoms, they often come out as an electron-positron pair, and it can happen at several different energy levels. Well, the team in Hungary noticed an excess in their energies at 17 mega electron volts. This basically means that a particle is being created at 17 mega electron volts and then was quickly decaying. And it's happening so regularly that it was given a 6.8 sigma statistical significance. And remember, the Higgs boson only had a five. So a new particle was discovered. That's cool, but why is that such a big deal? Well, because of some quantum measurements and things like isospin and spin parity, they had to conclude that it was what was called a spin one gauge boson. And if you were paying attention earlier, gauge bosons are force carriers. So if we discovered a new gauge boson, we discovered a new fundamental force. A fundamental force that operates at a very low energy level, which is something that you think we would have found by now, unless 
If the force interacts very weakly with regular matter and is dark to electromagnetism, it could have been there this whole time and we just never would have seen it, which is starting to sound a lot like dark matter. And this is not to say that we discovered dark matter, it could also be a type of force that works as a go-between between between regular matter and dark matter. Obviously a lot more testing needs to be done, but this is a super exciting discovery that could lead to a whole new understanding of our universe and the forces that guide it. Now, I'm just going to say this right now, I left a lot of stuff out of this video and I'm sure I got something wrong, so a lot of you out there are smarter than me. If I got something wrong, please politely correct me in the comments below and I will feature that in a new video in the future. If your mind was blown in this video, please give it a like, share, or a subscribe because I come back with videos just like this every Monday. Thanks a lot for watching. I want to give a special shout out to my patrons on Patreon for their support for this channel. Couldn't do it without you. You guys go out and have an eye-opening week and I'll see you next time. Love you guys. Take care.